few more people peter in. Today, uh, a summarization of what we're doing. To catch up, our syllabus indicates that the last time we would meet, we would do macro theory. Big ideas about human environment interaction. Previously, I've talked about a context of interscience. Come in, come in here. A context of interscience where the social, biological, and physical are together. And if we've had environmental sociology for maybe 40 years now, what large ideas of history and theory has it developed? I said earlier that there are five different theories. Malthusianism, eco-Marxism, ecological modernization, uh, social construction of environment, as well as a new ecological theory. But today, we're going to look at organizational issues, and that's what I call macro theories. So, on the, this is a summary of what we're doing today. I've given a short highlight of many different authors, including myself, and I have some PowerPoints of my own work to demonstrate that, since the point of this course is an exploration of my thought to help you understand me here. First of all, we'll look at the words that are underlined. Every word underlined, I suggest, is important. So write those down if you want to remember important points of today and want to think about them. We'll look at biomes, ecoregionalism, and bioregionalism. Biomes and ecoregionalism are local regional issues of the world. How does the physical world of the environment get organized? And bioregionalism is the cultural connections of different human groups to that. We'll talk about Nabhan's book, Sublime Sun Like It Hot, where he argues that over thousands of years, humans in their genetic material have built themselves into regions that were not a common species, that we are regional in our culture and our genetics by how our food metabolizes in our bodies and our food grows only in certain climates. So over thousands of years, people have regionalized in their genetics. That's a fascinating book if you're interested in this local aspect. So that's a very huge macro theoretical idea that the world is regionalized based upon these issues of food, culture, geography, and genetics. On top of this, if you can think of these sort of small-scale regional issues, on top of this, we have larger organizations over multiple regions. And we might think about Carnero's work in the origin of the state. You know, what is the state? Most people think about the state as a human institution. He argues the state and its development is built from an environmental context. And we need to understand that environmental context that built the state. His term is environmental circumscription. We'll come back to that. And how environmental conflict can lead to the beginning of states. Uh, bodily, it's important to mention that as late as 1850, half of the world was not under the jurisdiction of states. Half of the world lived in this type of world, in a regional environment with little states. And it's only for the past 150 years that structures of territorial states dominate most of the planet. Um, that's another big view. Diamond, uh, Jared Diamond, who's actually a biologist, but he's interested in why did human development become more hierarchical in some places or not. And he argues certain materials allow us to be more hierarchical. And we'll just discuss more of that in a minute. Here, please come in. And then I have a PowerPoint of myself. If states are connected to the environment, I argue urbanization is connected to the environment. We like to think that urbanization is a way we separate ourselves from the common rural environment. But I argue environmental scale and organizations are very much a part of how the environment is organized. And we'll look at that in my book or my uh, topic called Raw Materials and the Division of Labor. Uh, Dreisick is an environmental sociologist. He argues 
there is a global environmental movement, but there's four types of interaction between environmental social movements and states. And what can be said about the four different cultures of environmentalism around the world? Once again, a huge macro theory. We're summarizing macro theory ideas today. And this is a two-page PowerPoint uh, before we go into that. And Jaspers, this is German, so Jaspers, is Karl Jaspers. He argues thousands of years ago, humans religiously in their identity were connected to particular local regions. And why do we change? He argues the axial religions happen. Axial religions are when we supposedly lost our environmental connection. We no longer worship the mountain behind Kukmin University. And we no longer consider that the shaman presence, where every year we would travel to the shaman on the mountain and become healed by relation to the mountain. We don't typically have cultures connected to particular regions anymore. Instead, large philosophical systems, metaphysical systems of religion that developed during the axial period. This would be the invention of Judaism, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Confucianism. These large-scale structures typically are separated from environmental issues. But I argue, if you look at the history of axial religions, a lot of those religious movements did have environmental context. And we'll talk about my uh, book from 2009 called Ecological Revolution and the slow and fast versions that I see in human history of this. Uh, someone else interested in macro theories of environment, uh, an environmental sociologist named Sing Chu, and his idea of the dark ages, that historically societies destroy their environment and fell apart, their complicated aspects fell apart into regional conflicts. And he says, this is a dark age for humans, but it's a bright age, a you know, sunny age, because the environment recovers for hundreds of years. So dark ages may be for human you know, complexity, but uh, a bright age, a sunny age for human recovery. Also, we'll look at more modern views of macro theory, mostly around the idea of commodity chains. Commodity chains are ideas that have been invented by a man named Wallerstein. Wallerstein in his world systems theory, the idea that there is not a national economy, but different national economies are linked in a world system where the material flows between countries are the nervous system of the world. So that's a very environmental sociological topic. Uh, dependency theory is the idea that development in one place is based upon the destruction of development in other places by taking their raw materials, taking their wealth. But that's also a global system view of development. And an update to these, we might think about Saskia Assassin, her idea of the global city, that cities at least after 1980, are no longer connected to a particular local culture, but they are part of a global system of control that uh, organizes a very decentralized production and raw material extraction. So global cities have more in common with each other than different cultures would. Also, we will talk about some of the first three macro theories, Neo-Mathusianism, which is the idea that population over long periods of time uh, builds and destroys the environment. We will critique this with uh, a comment about Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen is a Nobel Prize winning economist that in 1983 wrote a famous book called poverty and famines, where he argues that famines don't occur when there's a lack of food, famines don't occur when there's too much people, famines occur when people do not have political rights to food. So it's a political rights issue, he says, that causes famine. And that's a very hybrid topic of environmental sociology once more. Eco-Marxism is the idea that capitalism organizationally destroys the environment. 
We alienate ourselves from the environment, just like capital and labor become alienated. Ecological modernization ideas are capitalism can be built to profit and expand with the environment. So this is the idea that the organization of our economy destroys the environment. And ecological modernization is the idea that we can change materials and change the organization so that we can economically grow and protect the environment. So this you know, conflict between environment and economic development is seen in this tradition. And thus, environmental protection and economic growth are linked in ecological modernization ideas. Um, the term here is inconspicuous consumption. Inconspicuous consumption means a consumption that we're not aware of, a consumption we don't think about. We don't think about electricity. We don't have a culture where you know, we consume a certain kind of electricity. And Shove and Ward, they say, that's very interesting because a lot of our modern consumption is built into infrastructures that we don't think about. A lot of sociologists look at consumption and they think about style. They think about cultural connections. But Shove and Ward says, a lot of our consumption has no symbolism. Like, I would love to go to the wall over here and make a personal choice. I would choose solar panels on the roof of our building, if I could. But instead, I'm not given a choice. Someone else has decided the electricity. And that's what they mean by inconspicuous consumption. It's not overt and symbolic. It's silent. It's inconspicuous. And it encourages certain forms of consumption without our participation. How many of you own an electric car? I don't see any hands. How many of you own a car based on water? How many of you have a car or access to a car that runs on gasoline? There you go. The point is, we're not typically choosing the energy. That's what they're talking about. We're not given permission, typically, to choose the energy. Somebody else is choosing it, and that's what they mean by inconspicuous consumption. A good example of this uh, is a book by Edwin Black, where he looks at the global politics of oil. Uh, you can look up his book if you're curious. Also, I recommend the syllabus to download or find a copy of the film called Who Killed the Electric Car? It's an excellent example of inconspicuous consumption. Most people were not aware that 10 years ago, uh, Japanese and American automobile manufacturers made completely electric cars, but then they hid them from the public. They didn't tell anybody they existed. And they changed the laws to make sure they were not required to make them in the United States. And that film is about how consumers were totally unaware, for the most part, that options existed. Also, in a later section of this course, I think in two more sessions, we'll talk more about this idea of inconspicuous consumption under my term, a politicized consumptive infrastructure, where we think about the politics of particular materials, like oil versus other things in the energy category, oil or nuclear or anything, is a raw material regime. And a raw material regime is an economic and political regime of certain materials against other materials. It's like organic food versus uh, pesticide, basically. These are two different regimes, and they politically and economically fight each other for the same position. It's not, it's an argument that materials are not just individual, but that material decisions have a lot to do with politics and building investment structures. And I argue there's three levels, I call it ILL. There's an institutional factor, there's a legal factor, and there's legitimacy, there's a cultural discourse. People talk positively or negatively about materials. That materials are not only material, they're always cultural. And uh, that's what we will try to do a few of summaries of today. <laughs>